noon session. But I've put them up now, and as we get going, I'll I'll refer people back to them probably at the end, um, or maybe just as as we get underway. And the recording has been started, so people will be able to retrieve those from the recording. Yeah, Fred. Uh, the one problem with those uh, trap trees as you're um, that you're putting up. Um, just be aware that when you kill a tree, you're responsible for taking care of it. And actually, it was interesting. We found some trap trees in Randolph uh, where we um, got bugs in traps, in the purple sticky traps on the tree, but we didn't find them within the tree uh, where they had laid eggs and the larvae had begun working. Um, and the opposite was also true, where we did not get any in the uh, purple trap on the tree, but then we got bugs within the tree itself. So um, if you're using it for, uh, for, um, for how do you say, uh, presence and absence of the EAB, you really need to um, skin the tree as well as uh, look at the purple trap on it. Uh, Tommy, I, I no, you got to kill it. Uh, we tried uh, scoring a tree, taking the bark off half the tree, and it just doesn't work. Uh, you really need to peel off uh, a band of uh, the phloem all the way around the tree and kill it. Um, single girdle. Uh, when you use a single girdle, that usually is a girdle. Um, also, uh, the the uh, one of the things that I try and do when I do girdle a tree, I try and I use a pruning saw and I try not to score the xylem. Uh, if you score this, I don't want to go into the xylem because I want water to be moved up into the foliage to keep it nice and fresh and emitting those wonderful chemicals. But uh, we're getting off topic, Peter. It's already past time. Yes. Yes, I'm going to. I was <clears throat> going to let you finish that. I wasn't going to cut you off midstream. Oh, you're so uh, polite. Well, it's, 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 you know, we're within the discipline of entomology, so it's, it's, uh, it's all fair game. A final call to folks who are interested in continuing education credits, there's a link in the center of the screen to a cornell.qualtrics site, and that will allow you to uh, record some simple information. If you're interested, click it now. It'll, it'll pre-open. It'll automatically open a new window in your browser or copy and paste it uh, because in about 10 seconds you won't be able to access that anymore. I'll be uh, clicking us over to uh, the presentation mode. So hold on to your chairs. Here we are. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Whitmore. Mark's a friend and colleague in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell where we work uh, both of us work through the Cornell Cooperative Extension System primarily, working on a variety of projects. Mark is a multi, multi decades entomologist and has been um, <laughs> has been seeing the corners of the state dealing with emerald ash borer. And he and I chatted a couple months ago and said, you know, there's some other bugs that are pesky little critters that we shouldn't lose sight of. And so we thought we'd talk, we wouldn't talk, Mark would talk about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. So with that, Mark, I'm going to turn off my microphone and just hover in the background. Welcome. Okay, hover away, Pete. Um, yeah, uh, this is actually, it, it's a delight uh, speaking about the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid at this time, uh, especially considering the depression I'm going through working on Emerald Ash Borer. Um, because uh, I, I do think that there is a, a hope um, with the hemlock woolly adelgid, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Uh, um, you know, it's like we can do things, but you know, just like with with other invasive forest insect pests at this time, we've got to be on it. Uh, we can't waste any time. Um, and so I basically uh, started working on the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, a couple of years ago when we first got it into the uh, 
uh, the Finger Lakes region here in New York State. But uh, as Pete mentioned, I'm a multi-decade, probably you know, close to I went after the dinosaurs left the earth. I started studying forest entomology out in the Pacific Northwest. I'm from Washington State, and I started studying the balsam oleodelgid, which is on true fir trees. And I'm going to allude to my experience uh, with the balsam oleodelgid uh, um, during this because there's a lot of analogies, uh, a lot of similarities uh, in the way they operate. So, um, you know, basically, th this is a, you know, forest entomology right now is, it's, it's really interesting um, because most of my life I was working on insects that are native, trying to, uh, you know, reduce damages uh, um, and, um, and figure out, you know, how to retain uh, timber value. But now we're dealing with some really, uh, really ugly problems. Uh, something, you know, things that I just never even considered happening, like the emerald ash borer, perhaps taking out a whole genus of trees in North America. Then the Asian longhorn beetle, heaven forbid that gets loose, uh, you know, taking out maples uh, as well as birches and poplars. Uh, but the hemlock woolly adelgid is in the same category. It's, uh, you know, it threatens um, our hemlock resources. And, you know, talk to anybody in the south and uh, they're, they'll tell you the stories of how it's just moved in like a freight train. Um, so, Hemlock woolly adelgid, Adelgis tsugi, um, is an import from China uh, and and Japan. Actually, I think the biotype we have in the in the East Coast uh, is from Japan. Um, there it is, right there. It's a very photogenic uh, thing. This is a electron micrograph to show you that it does have segments, even though when you look at it, it's less than a millimeter or so in size. It just looks like a, a quivering blob of protoplasm. But what it does is it inserts its, uh, it has piercing sucking mouth parts, it's basically an aphid, and it inserts its mouth parts uh, into the twig, the phloem tissue, um, right at the base of each needle. Um, and if you look right here, uh, you can actually see little tiny black dots right there. That is actually the uh, first instar that has settled down for the summertime uh, to basically what we normally say overwinter, but it's over summering in a resting stage. So what are the problems? Uh, you know, it's like the biggest problem with this bug is its reproductive potential uh, and the fact that it doesn't have to mate. They're parthenogenetic, um, all females. So. Females, they just lay eggs, the eggs hatches, ha hatch, and then they can lay more eggs. Um, the reproductive potential uh, is, is just phenomenal. And this is a very conservative estimate with two generations a year and up to 300 eggs per female. Um, just conservatively, you have one female starting times 200 eggs times 100 eggs equals 220,000 potential progeny from one female at the beginning of the season. Um, that's just, that's phenomenal even for an insect. Um, we don't have any natural enemies in the eastern United States. Uh, and I must say at this time, it's very interesting that the adelgids in general, they have no parasitoids or little wasps, which a lot of insect uh, have as, as uh, natural enemies. They only have predators. Um, and so far there's no resistance to uh, uh, the eastern hemlock species, the Carolina hemlock and eastern hemlock at this time. And there are no real uh, area-wide treatments um, that are available uh, e economically and environmentally. Um, and perhaps one of the problems uh, with this as well as other uh, invasive insects is that they're very difficult to detect at low population levels. Once you find them, you've already got a well-established population and you better start working on it fast. Um, so um, the life cycle is actually uh, fascinating. It's one of the most complex uh, in the insect world. There are two hosts two host tree species. Uh, there are hemlocks and there are spruce. Uh, the hemlock is the asexual stage and um, that's the only stage that we have that's successfully established in North America. The sexual stage you can see, uh, let me get the pointer up here, um, the sexual stage is generated uh, here where a winged adult is formed in the progridians generation. And that winged adult uh, in its area of nativity, which is uh, um, you know, Japan and China, will actually go off and find a spruce tree and then go through a sexual generation on the spruce tree and then it'll come back to the uh, hemlock later on as an asexual. So um, here you go. Uh, so 
let's just start at the beginning here. Uh, where you have eggs, say, in the beginning of June? Uh, it just depends on, te on temperature accumulation. The eggs hatch. Um, they turn into the dispersal stage, the first instar crawler. And here, you look over here, there's a, there's a, that's a crawler. Imagine the whole bug uh, here is like a millimeter in size. That crawler is pretty darn small. Um, it's interesting, though, if you look at it under a microscope, those legs really do work, and it's actually quite quick uh, in its movement. Um, I think this is important uh, because birds are implicated as being an important um, mechanism of transport. And imagine a bird landing on a twig. Uh, then that crawler just hops right on the bird's foot. The bird travels off. And what does it do? It lands on another twig. If it's a hemlock uh, and the crawler is lucky enough to get off at that point in time, bingo. Uh, you have a, a new infestation starting. Um, wind is another transportation element. Uh, you can imagine, though, it's pretty random, uh, which you know, might explain the, uh, uh, you know, the heavy, uh, high reproductive potential. But you know, I really do think that, that birds are probably more important. We haven't done very many studies on that. I think the only thing is uh, where somebody trapped some birds and did find uh, some crawlers on their feet. Um, so as you go through the summer, it turns into the estivating nymph, which is this little black thing. That's all that you see in the summertime. It's really hard to see. And it actually serves them very well, because when are most of the predators out looking for food? in the summertime. Um, then you get towards uh, October, beginning of November, that's when it really starts to develop, when the first instar starts puffing up um, and growing its wax. As you see here, this is wax over the body. Here's, here's an adult right here um, with all the wax peeled off. Uh, the wax is like a protective uh, uh, coating over it. And so as, as the uh, development occurs, really the waxy uh, uh, cotton balls uh, really become apparent um, in January, it become most apparent in January, February, and March. And in March, the adult lays its eggs. Here are the eggs right here. I'll show you some more pictures later. The eggs hatch once again, go through the crawler stage and all the nymphal development. And then you get this winged adult form. Um, the interesting aspect of this uh, is that there are um, how do you say, population fluctuations uh, that you'll see. Sometimes you'll see a tree that'll be plastered one year, and then the next year uh, it'll, it'll be like vacant. And one of the things that happens is that uh, uh, the adults of the cistern's generation, um, they have a way of sensing food quality. And when you get a very heavily infested tree, uh, the food quality will diminish. And at that point in time, it, there's some kind of trigger, we think, that uh, tr causes the uh, adult of the the systems generation to uh, produce, like, decide that it's going to produce only so many of the asexual form that stays on hemlock, and it'll produce a certain amount of uh, the sexual generation with wings that will depart the tree. Well, this is actually cool around here because actually it works like a, a population vacuum because there are no spruce trees in North America that are uh, that it will survive on so the population just disappears um, sometimes you it's just really remarkable the difference that it, that occurs um, Fortunate. Well, I don't know. Uh, Cornell campus, just right outside my office almost, we have uh, a patch of about four or five uh, spruce trees from Japan uh, growing on the slope. And the populations around Ithaca aren't uh, great enough right now, but I've sort of been watching those things, curious if we'll ever get a sexual generation uh, surviving on that spruce. And please don't tell anybody on the grounds crew. I don't want them to treat that tree right away. Maybe once this, once maybe once it gets going, um, but anyway. Um, so that's generally the uh, um, life cycle of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, here's some uh, wonderful photos of once again the adult with the uh, wax pulled off. These are the eggs here. They're pretty small, and this is what it looks like normally if you sort of pick away at the the wool on a, on an adult, and those eggs will pop out. Um, Here's uh, another photo of, of the crawler, the first instar crawler. Um, and these are the estivating um, uh, first instar nymphs that have settled. Once the first instar settles and inserts its stylets uh, into the bark, into the xylem tissue, actually, is where it feeds, um, it doesn't move from that point on. It stays in place uh, throughout its lifetime until it dies. Um, 
So uh, what is the impact on the trees? Okay, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, it inserts its stylets or, or sucking mouth parts at the base of the needles and feeds on the xylem ray parenchyma cells. And basically, you know, it triggers, I think, a, uh, a pretty universal, universal response in trees uh, to an injury, which is basically to well it off. Uh, and and um, and doing so, it it sort of it will clog its own. Uh, um, conductive tissue, which will gradually kill the foliage and the buds on the twigs. And so you'll see the crowns lightening up um, as the infestation continues. It reduces radial growth, of course. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is it, it kills trees in four to ten years or so. In the south, in the uh, uh, Appalachian Mountains, uh, where it got basically got going really, really uh, um, early on, um, it's so warm that it can kill a tree within four years. Um, up here uh, in New York, where it's a little bit cooler, um, it takes who knows how long. I'm, I'm still, I haven't seen any mortality in the Finger Lakes region yet, but I think I might uh, this year uh, uh, be witnessing the first mortality. So that would be five, six years, or maybe a little bit more. Hard to tell how long that tree was infested because the earlier the infest, early infestations are difficult to see. Um, but basically, the older trees are the first to die. You know, the big, huge trees uh, where, you know, they, they have a, a vascular system that's already somewhat compromised. And um, any infestation or death of needles sort of reduces its ability to, uh, to draw up the necessary uh, minerals and water into the foliage. Um, and the also thing, uh, the thing is the HW uh, hemlock woolly dildo is found throughout the crown of the tree. It's an advantage for detection, but it means that, you know, it's like one part of the crown just does not uh, uh, survive. It it's, it's pretty thorough in its infestation. Um, so what are the hosts? Um, Eastern hemlock, uh, Tsuga candidensis, Carolina hemlock, Tsuga caroliniana, and Western hemlock. And, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, um, you know, I'm from Washington State and I started, you know, learning forest entomology, uh, um, and uh, we never even learned about the hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid. It's extant on western hemlock. I've seen it many times uh, in, in many of the parks out there, uh, but the trees, they look just fine. Um, and there was a study done and found that um, there are actually, you know, over 20 uh, predators that feed on it in western North America. Um, where we, as we don't have any out here. Um, now, just this last, uh, my last trip out to visit my folks, I actually went to the uh, University of Washington Arboretum and talked with one of the arborists there. And he guided me to a place where there are actually a number of plantings of Eastern Hemlock in the Arboretum there uh, in Seattle. And um, there they were, they were infested. They definitely had Hemlock Willi adelgid, but they didn't look very peaked at all. They were, looked like they were just fine. And uh, the trees had been planted in, uh, I believe, 1945. And so they'd been there a long time, been exposed to Hemlock Willi adelgid all along. And so why? What's what's going on? The Western Hemlock right next to it, they had Hemlock Willi adelgid. You know, is it the predators? Um, or is perhaps there's something about uh, the uh, coffee in Seattle that uh, the Eastern Hemlock uh, likes, or I shouldn't say that, uh, the something about the climate uh, in Seattle that uh, triggers some kind of resistance in the eastern hemlock. Uh, we don't really know uh, what it is. Uh, it'd be a fun fun topic to investigate. But suffice it to say, we definitely have problems out here on the east coast. Um, here's a map. Uh, I don't know why the smiley face is there. Boy, I, that's sort of funny. Um, but anyway, so uh, basically the story is it got established here in the Richmond area um, in the mid-50s. And it sort of flopped around down there because there isn't a lot of hemlock uh, in the surrounding Piedmont area there um, until it got up into the Appalachian Mountains. And then it started to really go crazy. And since that time, it's you know spread almost down to the extreme southern edge of the range of, of eastern hemlock. Uh, it's, it's totally encompassed the range of Carolina hemlock, and there's a, a big movement afoot uh, to try and save Carolina hemlock as well as eastern hemlock and some of the prized forest in the southern Appalachians at this time. 
It moved up uh, uh, the eastern seaboard uh, to uh, Long Island, uh, Hudson River Valley, um, and there's some thought that maybe the hurricane blew it across over into uh, uh, Connecticut and such, but it's been established in those regions uh, for quite a while. Here in the Finger Lakes, uh, we just got it a couple years ago, 2009 or no, 2008, and um, it's been spreading since that time. Uh, um, the uh, presence up here uh, in Monroe County, this is a county-wide thing, it was actually one tiny spot in a park, uh, and we think that we might have gotten rid of it there. But it's spreading throughout the Finger Lakes region right now. In fact, we added a couple of counties down here to make it basically contiguous with the infestations in Pennsylvania at this time. Um, so as you notice, hemlock does go way up here into Canada uh, and out here into Wisconsin. So there's a lot of the range of hemlock uh, yet to be, um, how do you say, uh, taste tested by the hemlock oleodelgid. And I'll discuss uh, sort of my feelings on that uh, using this photo, this picture. Um, Talbot Trotter, uh, a colleague in the Forest Service, he's at Yale actually, uh, he did a, a, a a really interesting study where he went all throughout the range of the hemlock oleodelgid with temperature instruments, uh, looking at uh, very closely at, at the temperatures that they encounter. And um, I, sh I should backtrack a little bit. Uh, temperature is thought to be really important uh, in uh, um, the development and mortality of hemlock oleodelgid. There's been studies that have shown that um, winter temperatures down to minus 20 degrees uh, uh, Celsius uh, will kill the hemlock oleodelgid, uh, kill a significant portion of the population, 90, 98, 90, 99%. Um, now, how often that occurs, I think, uh, depends on the microclimate and um, a lot of factors. However, if you look at this map, you see the blue part um, is actually the part that uh, um, uh, let me get that pointer back. This is the part that Talbot feels like every year there are temperatures that are sufficient enough to maintain viable populations of the hemlock oleodelgid. Um, in this light blue, it's every two years uh, uh, you have a good year. Uh, the uh, you get up in the Adirondacks here, every 10 years uh, there's there's a good year, and then you get up here uh, and there's every 50 years. Now. Um, the interesting thing, uh, I'm bringing up the, uh, the balsam oleodelgid at this time. Um, when I first studied, started studying uh, uh, bugs, actually it was the balsam oleodelgid that, that got me interested in the bugs because it was killing my favorite stand of true furs on the slopes of one of the volcanoes in Washington State. And it was really interesting because it was on a lava flow and then as soon as you got into more mesic soils, it stopped. There was no infestation at all and I thought that was pretty cool. And then I started thinking about bugs and movement and all those other interesting things they did. So I, I quickly turned from a, a forester and botanist into a forest entomologist. I just, I think it's just really, really interesting. But anyway, at that time I tried to get money to work on the balsam oleodelgid and um, I was told that uh, the balsam oleodelgid was not a problem, uh, that it uh, is, is killed by cold temperatures and it was not going to move off of the, uh, uh, out of the maritime provinces. Uh, where it was held pretty close to the um, coastline in New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia and such, and that it wouldn't move over the Cascade Crest uh, uh, in Washington State. And at the time I was looking around and I was seeing it move. Um, and now, uh, 30 years later, um, it has definitely moved uh, into the uh, Cascade Mountains, into the east side of the Cascades where it's much significantly colder. And indeed I was just vacationing in the uh, Mount Washington area, and I found balsam oleodelgid on balsam fir very close to the upper part of the summit, and everybody knows uh, probably how cold it is up on Mount Washington. I'm also finding it in the Adirondacks. I was finding it in the Adirondacks, actually, in the, in the 80s. So what does that say? To me, it says that there is an adelgid out there that reacted at first when it was introduced into the United States uh, in a manner similar to what we're seeing with the hemlock oleodelgid, where it is sensitive to temperatures and people, we feel that it is limiting the population growth. Um, but that changed. And so my question is, uh, will that happen with the hemlock oleodelgid? Um, and I don't really know. Uh, 
It'd be, uh, I think it's a really important question to investigate, and perhaps we have the tools now to, to look at that, the genetic tools, um, um, and, and answer that question. But be that as it may, uh, what we have right now is this map, and I think it's a, a, an excellent piece of work by Talbot. Um, another way to think about uh, where you are in relationship to the hemlock woolly adelgid is to look at temperature data and I have to uh, thank my friends at the uh, Northeast Regional Climate Center here at Cornell um, uh, for developing these series of maps and I was thinking about it when I first when we first got it in the Finger Lakes I was thinking okay we're, we're pretty cold we uh, we you know we get those nice cold winds down from Canada in the winter time um, and then I started looking at it more carefully, and actually after riding the lifts, talking to my uh, my friend uh, Art Gitano at the Northeast Regional Climate Center, and he said, no, 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 you <laughs> we're in a banana belt. And, and sure enough, he's right. If you look at the degree day accumulation here, here you have Finger Lakes region, and then look right down here in the Delaware Water Gap. There's a lot of trees dying right now in the Delaware Water Gap. Uh, it's very similar, and so it's like I no longer have that that confidence that we have time in the Finger Lakes, and indeed, I've watched pop major population expansions, and uh, and as I mentioned, perhaps uh, mortality occurring. Here's another way to look at it: look at the low temperatures, uh, 2001 to 2010, mean annual low temperature, and once again, you can see here in the Finger Lakes, we're actually quite mesic, uh, and very com very close comparison to many areas where the hemlock woolly adelgid has been very successfully established and has caused a lot of mortality. Um, contrary to that, uh, my friend uh, uh, um, uh, Joe Elkington at uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, he says, well, Mark, you know, where it's cold, you know, they just don't kill the trees. And I, I'm sort of wondering about that. He says, I've been watching a tree that's been infested for 17 years. Um, it's still alive. And Joe Elkington is right up here. Amherst, I guess, is, yeah, right up in there. So it's pretty cold. The question is, in my mind still, will it, will it change? Will it adapt to those cold temperatures? And here's another way to look at the lowest temperature during the decade. So as you can see, it's, it's rather interesting. There's another, there's a corridor of warm, uh, uh, of, of, of warm weather through this area. I didn't realize existed before. Um, but anyway, um, so will cold temperatures be effective? Uh, um, you know, it's like not in the Finger Lakes. Um, and indeed, you know, to control the uh, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, with such an incredible reproductive potential, you basically, to maintain a static population, you have to kill like 98% of all the bugs that are generated every year. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering about the Susquehanna River and, and its tributaries. I just, uh, one thing I do know from my, uh, uh, from, uh, from my friend Art Digitano at the Northeast Regional Climate Center, is that there's usually an awful lot of things operational uh, in creating uh, the weather patterns. Like you know, the Ontario Plain, you see it's actually quite warm, but actually the Ontario Plain this er early in the season was one of the coldest areas uh, in the region. It was actually much warmer in the Finger Lakes area. And that's because the uh, Ontario Plain temperatures were actually kept low by the uh, Lake Ontario. Um, but anyway, so here it is in the Finger Lakes. Uh, we get uh, all these. When we first got it, um, it was found established at a couple locations. Uh, and um, let me see, uh, Watkins Glen, and up around here, uh, and on Cayuca Lake. Um, it's quickly expanded. That was 2008. We figured the populations had been established for at least a few years. Um, but we quickly, it was interesting, very, very interesting. Um, in 2009, it was established on the Cornell plantations uh, in the Cornell campus. And that was really a godsend to us because um, it basically got Cornell uh, uh, um, uh, personnel involved in the issue. And Cornell owns a lot of property in the area uh, where they manage natural areas. And so they're very concerned because they have some prize uh, uh, stands of hemlock uh, in the gorges surrounding the area. And so we initiated an effort uh, to uh, recruit volunteers to go out and look. And and look around and see what's going on. And so we got a really good idea of what happened in, in the uh, Ithaca area, at least, as well as on uh, uh, Seneca Lake. There are lots of volunteers around the Seneca Lake. And um, so 
we've been watching the populations expand, you know, having this baseline of knowing where it was and where it wasn't. Uh, we've been watching it expand, and it's been quite rapid. Actually, there's a couple spots in here that we that we haven't put in yet, um, prized pieces of uh, hemlock territory in the Finger Lakes. Once again, looking at the coldest temperatures uh, uh, in the Finger Lakes region, you can see that uh, we are definitely uh, in a banana belt when it comes to temperatures uh, in the Finger Lakes area. So. I think, you know, at this point in time, um, I think it's really important for people to sit back and, and really consider uh, what our hemlock resource is all about. Um, you know, like in the Finger Lakes region, um, it's it's really I think it's really is a, what what I would refer to as a keystone species. Uh, it really um, is important along stream sides, uh, especially going the gorges, the steep gorges entering into the lakes. Uh, like here, you see here at uh, uh, along this is actually the Bear Swamp Creek uh, that flows into Skinny Atlas Lake. This is just loaded with hemlock all and down this up and down the slopes. And we have Skinny Atlas Lake, beautiful uh, uh, lake. It happens to be actually one of the few uh, AA unfiltered water sources uh, in the nation, uh, and it feeds water into the city of Syracuse. Right now, the city of Syracuse is actually very concerned about um, the potential demise of hemlocks along these along these stream corridors, and also the uh, with the uh, emerald ash borer. Um, a lot of these uh, areas along here are old fields that having gone through succession and are heavily stocked with ash. So they're actually really worried about stream erosion um, but you know it's like it's not just stream erosion the impact on soils um, yes and the steep gorges it's really important but you know I'm also been thinking okay so what does it mean to have an acidic soil in an area that's surrounded by basic soils uh, we have a lot of, of basic soils in the Finger Lakes area especially the northern part of the Finger Lakes um, and I just don't know I study bugs not bacteria that much um, and you know it's like the moderation of forest and stream water temperatures is really important for trout, especially native brook trout. And you know what'll happen if hemlock goes? Um, you know it's like what's there to step in and take its place? And I right now we don't have any good answers for that. Um, the providing shelter for animals, especially in the winter time, and it's also uh, recognized as critical habitat for migrating neotropical bird species. Um, and then also, you know, consider the fact that uh, mortality, especially in heavily stocked stands, opens the stand to invasive species. Um, everyone loves walking through the woods and and running up against uh, multiflora rows. So, you know, I think we we have a situation that we really need to pay attention to um, and uh, think about. Uh, here we have the hemlock woolly adelgia. This is like. At, well, the first flush, uh, really heavy infestation on a tree. Um, the uh, I think this same tree two years later there were hardly anything on it, um, and the question is will they bounce back in, uh, the following year? And indeed uh, they did. So, um, what are some of the management challenges that that I perceive? Um, okay, there's no resistance uh, in eastern hemlocks. Um, there it spreads rapidly. Uh, it's very difficult to detect. Uh, there are no area-wide treatments available, uh, limiting uh, chemical treatments to individual trees. Uh, and I think perhaps one of the most important things to consider uh, in management is the fact that um, it's like it's really uh, reducing the genetic variability of of the of uh, um, of these species, and we have to pay attention to that in the future. Um, so what are the natural population controls of the hemlock woolly delta? Well, first of all, there's unsuccessful establishment. Imagine those crawlers getting blown through the wind. Uh, it's quite likely that they will not land uh, in a nice spot in order to settle down. Winter temperatures, as I mentioned before, uh, they can be significant. Uh, the density-dependent effects, where the population basically uh, is for they, they produce the winged, um, winged force, uh, winged forms that fly off the tree and land on something that they're not going to reproduce on. And then natural enemies. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, there's upwards over 20 uh, predators of the hemlock woolly diligid, but we're just working on getting some established now um, in the East Coast. Um, so next slide. Control options. Okay, biological control. 
uh, predators, chemical control, host resistance, um, somehow bringing host resistance in. Silviculture, uh, we really have not found any silvicultural manipulations uh, that, that reduce the, uh, or, or how would you say, enhance the strength of the trees that allows them to resist infestation. There are other approaches, and I'll touch on some of those as well. Uh, biological control, um, it's, uh, it's a very difficult field, and, and for a good reason. Um, it's, it's a specialty. I've worked in biocontrol for many years. And uh, it's because we've screwed up big time in the past. And everybody should know that from their biology lessons. And it's a good thing to know that, and it's a good thing to question it. But now, um, I think we realize the importance of being very diligent. And, and um, the first phase is uh, discovery, foreign exploration. Um, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to find these bugs in the native land because they're not epidemic. They're not killing all the trees, uh, and you gotta you gotta find them. Then you know you gotta evaluate uh, the biocontrol agents. Look at host specificity. The host specificity trials are exhaustive uh, for these species, and the feds just will not uh, allow you to release a bug unless it really has gone through very thorough host specificity training uh, trials. Um, then you can use pre-release field trials uh, to be sure it'll survive in the environment where you want to release it. Then you got to mass rear the bugs. Uh, you know, it's like everybody can mass rear mosquitoes, uh, fruit flies, um, but I tell you what, it's really hard uh, to rear some of these natural enemies, and it's it's a it's a very difficult task, and we don't aren't able to mass rear enough for inundative releases. Uh, we we actually release just a few bugs in what we call an inoculative release, which can be anywhere from, say, 100, 200 bugs in one location. Uh, and then we monitor uh, after we release them. Now, I've released uh, one bug four places in the Finger Lakes right now, and uh, post-release monitoring has revealed that we have actually have it's established in one location uh, in just one year, which is really remarkable. I, I usually expect it to be take a much longer time. Laracobius Grinus is the beetle that we've released. Uh, it's one of the most important predators in, in uh, the Pacific Northwest. We've actually released two biotypes uh, in the Finger Lakes area. One is from Puget Sound, and one is from uh, uh, high in the mountains in Ohio, Idaho. And the Idaho strain has become established. Um, but you know, I, I you know, having lived in the Pacific Northwest, I, I just really I, I don't think that the uh, climate is that much different between the two locations as far as uh, temperatures go. Although we don't get the really cold temperatures like we do in the Finger Lakes, uh, still, you know, I I, I have the feeling that we might be able to get the uh, uh, Puget Sound biotype to get established as well. Um, Laracobius is really good because it has a high rate of establishment where it's been released elsewhere on the East Coast. Um, and uh, um, yes, recoveries have increased uh, and indicating population growth does occur. Um, usually it takes two or three years before you can really find the bugs after you first release them. Um, so um, here's pictures of it. It's actually quite a cute little thing. Um, it's bigger. This is uh, where's the pointer? Uh, it's bigger than the hem than the hemlock woolly adelgid. It feeds on all life stages of the adelgid, uh, and and indeed all life stages uh, of the of the Laracobius will feed on them. So here you have a larvae, and here's the adult uh, feeding on them. Again, another adult. Um, not the biggest bug in the world. It's it's instead of being one millimeter like the hemlock woolly adelgid, it's probably closer to three millimeters long. So uh, it's searching for it. It can be tricky at times. Uh, here's another picture of it um, on on a twig. Um, so chemical control, I think, is something that we really need to consider while we're uh, waiting and, and working hard on biological control. Um, chemical control, we're very fortunate. Uh, um, and chemical control, it actually is quite efficacious. Um, Area-wide treatments don't exist. It's a tree-by-tree -tree thing. Um, foliar sprays, uh, stem injections, and soil injections uh, all work. Um, 
the professional use chemicals, those registered in New York State, and I must say that I'm not familiar with the chemicals uh, registered in other states. I know dinotefuran is, is registered in a number of states. It wasn't registered in New York until earlier this year. Um, and um, it's really important. Um, it's, it's called, uh, it's registered under a special local needs uh, registration because it is very um, water soluble. Um, and uh, the uh, the authorities um, in New York State were reticent to register it because of that water solubility. But I made the point uh, that it's really important uh, in protecting a very large old growth trees. Um, the, uh, the problem with old growth trees is, you know, especially if they've been infested for a year or two, is that they, their ability to translocate the uh, pesticide up into the crown is, is uh, uh, hampered. And um, imidacloprid the other chemical here, uh, it's actually, it's very effective. Uh, it's efficacious for up to seven years. Um, there's various formulations, but imidacloprid moves very slowly uh, up up the up the stem of the tree. Uh, Mitocloprid binds. It likes to bind to carbohydrates. Um, and so it'll move, it'll take maybe a year for imidacloprid to move into the crown of a tree. Well, in an old growth tree, um, it might not have that time. Uh, the crown might uh, degenerate such that it won't be able to get the imidacloprid up. And for a long time, they were losing uh, large hemlocks, uh, um, especially in the um, uh, southern Appalachians. Uh, and then they then they tried using the dinotefuran safari spray as a basal trunk spray, where you basically spray it with a surfactant. I'm not sure if you need the surfactant or not, but with the surfactant uh, on the, the lower uh, 10 or 15 feet of the tree, that gets taken up immediately um, and transported up into the crown, and then you make an application of imidacloprid and last ten years up to, up to seven years. And I think that's a phenomenal uh, um, uh, efficacy, and I think it gives us a valuable tool to try and preserve uh, some of the hemlocks that we have, some of our forest. Um, the uh, individual tree treatments, uh, foliar spray, uh, mineral oil, stem injection, and soil injection or drench. I think the foliar sprays, uh, horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps, you know, they, um, you know, I, in the good old days, I, you know, it's like I always cringed whenever I saw anything being sprayed in, in large volumes uh, throughout the forest. And I still cringe. And, you know, it's like horticultural oils, yes, they're sort of benign. And, you know, do I have any evidence? No, but uh, they are still, you know, broad spectrum. Uh, they kill everything, uh, as do the insecticidal soaps. Um, you know, maybe they might be easier on natural enemies. I'm not really sure about that. But, you know, suffice it to say, imagine uh, having to treat trees in a forest, uh, getting one of those rigs, and uh, spray rigs into a forest and having to spray them until they're dripping wet. And uh, as I mentioned before, you've got to get 98% control to have, maintain a static population. So you've got to coat those trees so they are uh, really, really thoroughly drenched. Um, as opposed to stem injections and the chemical control, it's uh, very focused uh, immediately on the stem of the tree, uh, very low volume. Uh, and when you use an injector, it is safe to use near water as opposed to soil drenches. Um, it has fast translocation. It's right in the tree itself. Uh, um, and um, we've been shown the efficacy is, is apparent. Uh, disadvantages, uh, the timing of treatment is important. Springtime is the best time to, to treat the tree. Drilling harms the tree. I, you know, I don't know if there's any arborists in the group here. I'd, I'd be curious about, about your impression on how many times you can drill a hemlock tree uh, over how many periods of time uh, without impinging on its its health. I think it's even more important when talking about ash trees and the emerald ash borer, where you have to uh, inject the tree every two, maybe three years at most. Um, one of the problems with uh, chemo with a, uh, the injection also is that it's it's very effective in young, vigorously growing trees, but not really in the big trees uh, because the imidacloprid moves so slowly. Um, and it gets uneven distribution in the crown. Uh, there's an effect that we call a like, candy striping, especially with imidacloprid. It doesn't like it. It adheres to the uh, carbohydrates, and it moves straight up and down the tree, but it doesn't move laterally very easily. And so you'll get like candy stripes moving up the up the trunk of the tree, and the branches that intercept it will be treated, and others may not. Um, 
The soil injection or soil drench, uh, you don't get the candy striping. Uh, again, it's a low volume. Um, ease of application is definitely there. No complicated equipment, just a, a mixing jar, and you uh, scrape the uh, organic material away from the base of the tree um, because, remember, it likes to adhere to carbohydrates, and you just pour it on, and the tree takes it up, and it takes it up very evenly. No candy striping, and amazingly, seven years of control. Actually, what happens is the uh, the chemical imidacloprid uh, gets up in the tree. It, the imidacloprid it doesn't last uh, for seven years, but actually it changes uh, in the chemistry of the hemlock into an olefin. And the olefin is actually, uh, it's a class of chemicals that is actually far more toxic to the hemlock woolly adelgia than is the original imidacloprid. Um, the disadvantages to soil drenches are that it's very difficult to use in shallow rocky soils uh, um, because it, it does, will move in the soil. Um, and and you can't use it uh, um, uh, near water or in high areas with a high water table. And indeed, uh, uh, soil drenches with the midacloprid are not available to homeowners in Long Island because of the sandy soils. Um, and you know, I worry about an area-wide impact on soil and aquatic arthropods. Um, I, I I hate to, to use my aunt as an example, um, but you know, she I, I know that there are others out there like her. Um, my, my recently departed aunt was a, a great influence in my life in many ways, and uh, she definitely influenced uh, my uh, observation of her pest control techniques, which were um, uh, basically, if a little bit works, a lot will work a lot better. And um, when you go to, you know, it's like, how many people that buy this stuff, they say, oh, this will protect my tea, great. You know, I'll, I'll get it, and I'll mix it up, and I'll put it on my trees. And they don't look at the label saying that, you know, there are, you can only put so many uh, uh, grams of active ingredient per uh, acre per year. And especially, you know, it's like, will they pay attention to the fact that there are streams nearby? And where are all the hemlocks? I mean, they're, they're near, they are near water most, a lot of the time. And so, um, and this is also an issue with uh, emerald dash bore. Um, you know, it's like you can use a midacloprid for it. It's not very effective. Um, but, you know, it's like uh, I just worry when you go into the store and you see right next to the midacloprid, it's like this controls emerald dash bore and people just pick it up and say, oh, great, gone. Okay. Um, host resistance. Um, oh, I must, I'm, I got to go back. I'm sorry. Um, um, with chemical control, there's actually another uh, um, uh, product that's just out. I'm sorry, I didn't put it in here. It's called Cortect. It's an also a professional application product, but it's really great, and that's what they're using a lot of in the uh, Southern Appalachians right now. And it actually, it's a, a pelletized formulation that is a time release. It releases the chemical over a two-year period of time, so you can actually apply treat twice as many trees as you can with a soil drench uh, at one application period. Um, and you can carry it in a little packet with you as you walk around the woods, and you take so many pa so many pellets per inch diameter of the tree. I think it's, it's a really, it's a, 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 a very good tool, and it's being used uh, uh, extensively right now in the Appalachian Mountains, where they're trying to save maybe 5% of all the hemlocks. Um, so host resistance, uh, people have been looking at it. It's been the holy grail. Uh, if we could ever find host resistance mechanisms and incorporate it, incorporate it genetically into the trees, we're still working on that. Uh, the hybrids, they've got one between uh, Tsuga caroliniana and Tsuga chinensis, um, and they are resistant. I think we need to test these uh, resistant um, uh, trees for a while. Still unable to hybridize uh, Tsuga canadensis. Um, and then putative resistance. I mean, every once in a while, people run across trees, and they say, man, it's still alive. This is remarkable. And uh, there's studies being conducted uh, at uh, uh, in Rhode Island right now looking at that resistance to see if it really is uh, solid resistance. Fungal pathogens is another possibility. There's a current effort being uh, waged right now by uh, Scott Costa in Vermont, where he's taken a, a fungal pathogen available off the shelf. He's uh, mixed it with uh, the whey from, uh, from the cheese making process uh, so that they have a little bit to eat on. And then they're spraying it over a wide area uh, and trying to get it established uh, to infect the hemlock woolly adelgid. But basically, that is a pesticide. Uh, it's being used like a pesticide. You'd have to use it year in and year out. Um, but it is an area-wide treatment. But it also, you know, I got to say, it's it's also broad spectrum. Uh, it'll kill everything. Um, yes, thank you, Pete. Uh, 
Just read and follow the label. You're absolutely correct. And there's another potential vulnerability with symbiotic working microorganisms in the guts, um, but uh, I'm not really familiar with that work to this point in time. So what can we do? We need to slow the spread. I think it's really important, uh, if at all possible. But how do we do that? Uh, you know, it's not like thermal dashboard where it's firewood. You know, don't move your firewood and that kind of thing. Um, really, this thing is is spreading uh, at its own rate. Um, <clears throat> but I think the most important thing is we need to uh, perhaps uh, prioritize our actions, our management actions. And one of the most important, I think, is to focus on genetic resources. Um, when I look at, uh, from my forest health perspective, when I do, when I look at an old tree in the forest, you know, a really healthy, beautiful old tree, I think, man, that is really an amazing uh, resource because it represents basically, um, it's a genetic encyclopedia of everything that has worked at that particular site. It's seen assaults from who knows what angles for you know up hundreds of years perhaps and it's still survived and that to me is very valuable. Um, and I think that we need to prioritize look keeping that in mind that it's important that uh, we conserve our genetic resources because you know also uh, um, I think throughout my career, uh, I've really come to believe that, um, you know, the genes, even though people say, oh, they look exactly the same, uh, I do think that there are subtle differences in the genetics of trees over maybe even, maybe not even long distances, you know, a few miles, maybe 10 miles or so, but for the future, for the future of the species to conserve our options, I think we need to pay attention to conserving as much of the genetic resources as possible at this time. Uh, we need to detect it quickly, be able to react, survey all the time, and then have treatments in mind. Um, detection, early detection is critical, yes. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Um, identify and train staff. Now, that's we've had great luck with that. Uh, it's easy to see. You see those those white dots under the tree. Uh, I mean, uh, on the twigs, and they're very easy to see. A lot of people just have no problem no noticing that. Uh, I think mapping and prioritizing hemlock stands is critical right now uh, in the Finger Lakes area, and I think wherever uh, you are on the leading edge of hemlock oleodelgid, you know, identify the high-value trees in parks, uh, you know, whatever your management uh, uh, priorities are, identify those trees now and be ready to act uh, when the hemlock oleodelgid comes into town. Uh, you know, it's like Look, look, uh, uh, look at areas like campgrounds and urban landscaping. I know that one of the infestations in the Finger Lakes actually was started by nursery stock transported from an infested area uh, into uh, the Finger Lakes. And people talk about bird feeders, uh, not hanging bird feeders in your hemlock tree. <coughs> and a part of our training uh, was basically to to look at the different symptoms. Here we have, uh, you know, the the oversummering. Uh, uh, Hardly hard to see uh, stage here. Here you have a medium infestation, and there's one one volunteer uh, in the uh, Cornell Plantations group that uh, I, he's he's a he's a bloodhound for hemlock woolly adelgids. I'm just amazed. He he walked into one stand and he found one tree that had just a couple bugs on it, and uh, looked all around. We couldn't find any other bugs anywhere else, and uh, that's, that was just remarkable. Then we also have the lookalikes here, spittle bugs, spider egg masses, scale insects, and oak skeletonizer. Um, so training up the people to do detection, I think, is a really, uh, really cool technique uh, to, to cover a large area very quickly. Um, Again, I went over the conserving genetic resources. I think you need to identify the best trees, vigorous, young uh, or mature trees. Uh, you know, a good crown, just you know, what your feeling is uh, for a really uh, healthy tree. Um, then, uh, um, you know, it's like find a location that is easily treatable with chemicals uh, to preserve uh, this tree because, you know, you're probably going to have to apply it, you know, who knows how long, you know, two, maybe three or four applications before we get biocontrol going. Um, and, you know, collect seed, I think is it's a good thing to do, but uh, hemlock seed has a very short shelf life. And actually, um, there's an operation, uh, a company in uh, um, uh, North Carolina that's been collecting seed from throughout the eastern seaboard and shipping it down to 
Chile of all places. And uh, there are no hemlocks in Chile. Uh, Podocarps, yes, but no hemlocks. So they figure they're pretty safe down there. Uh, establishing, They're establishing a seed orchard. Um, and uh, I, I applaud that effort. It's a very creative way to get around the short shelf life uh, of hemlock seed. And uh, seed viability is supposedly uh, much higher near the top of the tree. So if you're going to go out there and collect seed, try and get some from the top. Um, now think about treatments. Okay, you prioritized your stands. You're sort of thinking about what to do. You know, look at the treatments. Find somebody around uh, that can do it. Um, you know, pay attention once again to the streams and wetlands. Uh, uh, you know, know your liabilities. Know you know know how, how many hemlocks, where they are, and everything. You know, find a budget. Good luck. Uh, identify key personnel and find you know find people, find applicators that that uh, feel confident doing that or are willing to learn uh, about the hemlock woolly adelgid and and uh, uh, apply the chemicals. So, uh, with one of my favorite cartoons, I will end uh, this talk on hemlock woolly adelgid and entertain questions. Mark, this was a really good presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. While well, people are people are thinking up their questions, I'm going to do a little shuttle here. Mm -hmm. um, and just call people's attention to the very top of the screen. If you would please complete the exit survey, that's an important um, tool for us to document impacts and also improve the quality um, and variety of sessions that we offer. So with that, I will uh, just remind people I posted a couple of links. You can see the timestamp at to be 6.58, 18.58 two publications on woodlot and forest management related to uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. OK, we have a, so I see Carl has an yeah, interest in brown stink marmory bugs. Distinct bug. Is that what you're thinking about, Carl? Um, that is a, that's that's a pest. We just got a couple in Ithaca this year, actually. Uh, it's spreading really rapidly. And uh, of course, it's a primarily a pest of fruit trees. and. Uh, I'll eat a lot of different things. That's a, something to uh, stay tuned. Uh, much like the, um, oh boy, what do we have on the horizon? Oh, yes, the thousand cankers disease of, uh, of black walnut as well. Boy, that is a real sobering thing. Um, it was on the West Coast primarily. Um, boy, I've been hearing about it now for, oh, I'd say six, seven, eight years. And uh, now we just find it in four counties down in uh, uh, eastern Tennessee. Um, we're really, uh, really on the edge of our seat uh, about that one. Briefly mentioned silvicultural options for controlling HWA spread. Could I explain this in further detail? You know, the best thing to do is to look at uh, uh, um, uh, David Orwig's uh, um, uh, publications. Uh, he has done a lot of work. He's a silviculturalist, works in Harvard Forest. Um, basically, um, you know, it's like if you have contiguous forest, you're going to get more rapid spread throughout the stand than if you have a, a, a stand that's uh, uh, less densely stocked. Um, and uh, they've tried to do cuts to release the crowns so that they become more healthy, but that still does not seem to increase the resistance to hemlock woolly adelgid. So there's, there's still, it seems, a lot unknown about hemlock woolly adelgid in terms of um, how the insect spreads and how it selects you know, one tree over another, things like that. Is that accurate? Or, I mean, what's, well, do you have a sense of where, is there a lot of research being done, or is, is you know, are the other kind of big pests getting most of the Well, there you, you the hit attention. the nail on the head with that. Yeah, you know, the big the big bugs are sapping the, the, uh, the, the bug funding, um, per se. Um, there is a lot that needs to be done. And I mentioned, you know, the, the, pop, the ability of the populations to mutate and change is important. Also realize that the hemlock woolly adelgid does not select its trees. Uh, it is, it is uh, a passive in its dispersal. And if it successfully establishes at a location, that's great. Otherwise, you know, it's like it doesn't work. Um, 
And Bob, yeah, uh, so HWA sometimes starts 50 feet up in the tree where it's not easy to find. That is correct. Um, but the populations grow so rapidly that, that sooner or later, and very rapidly, they are, you'll find them on the lower branches. And so really, in detection surveys, uh, the, all you need to do is lower branches. I think it's really important um, to search a wider area rather than a small area very intensely. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we've been successful with our volunteer crews uh, in the Ithaca area is that uh, they can just walk through a stand and, and pretty much do a 100% sample um, through these gorges uh, pretty rapidly. Oh, I'm... Uh, oh, thank you. Just... Oh, that's not the... No, I... <laughs> wrong one. <laughs> wrong one. I got to click copy. Here we go. Coming at you again. Yeah, that's better. So here's um, I just posted under the Cornell.edu. This is Mark's fact sheet on hemlock woolly adelgid for people who are uh, have woodlots and want to try and do some things to keep track of it. I know that there are several of you who are kind of in the in the target of. Uh, where uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is or is soon to be moving or thought to be moving and this is a, a nice way to gain some insights into how to uh, try and find those pests. Yeah, I think start your control. The, uh, the sooner you can detect it in your area and and watch it spread the, the better off you'll be and you'll be able to hopefully uh, develop and implement management strategies uh, rapidly. Um, Will eventually kill the eventually Are there any southern efforts? range of eastern hemlock? Yeah, uh, Tommy, I, I do. Um, and indeed, I mean, it's like uh, if you go into the southern Appalachians, it's in some places where they have not been treating the trees. It's just, it's, it's, it's very sobering. Um, and indeed, you know, it's like uh, I've been discussing actually with a number of people, including Pete today. It's like, you know, even though I've been doing this a long time, it's still, I just, I just don't get it. Uh, it just doesn't make an impact until I see dead trees. Then all of a sudden, the gravity of the situation just, just hits you like a ton of bricks. And uh, I was just walking the proper property with a landowner up here in Monroe County, uh, Emerald Ash Borer infestation. I knew he had the infestation. We talked about it all winter long. And then just uh, last week, we uh, just after leaf out, we went walking down into there and, and um, he just, his jaw hit the floor and he said, man, I had no idea. And you know, what's that old Joni Mitchell song, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Um, it's, it's really true. Uh, it's just, it's, um, heck, you know, I think about it all the time. And, uh, but that's a really important motivational is force there any... to get you to do something. Um, and so, anyway, go ahead, Pete, sorry. Is there, I'm just curious, is there any effort to try and look at reestablishing some other shade tolerant, <laughs> deer resistant conifers in areas where um, hemlock had been? I mean, you, you've talked about kind of the ecosystem role that hemlock plays, and although a different species would probably behave differently, I'm, I'm thinking about something like red spruce and uh, in Norway spruce is not native, but um, so did any, are there any of those efforts? Oh, you know, people have talked about establishing Norway spruce in sites. Uh, I, you know, and, and red spruce, a native uh, bug. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a, a cerambicid beetle that was been uh, uh, introduced in um, um, into Nova Scotia, and it's moving its way through the native spruce forest right now. Um, you know, it's like I, I right now I'd prefer to try and work on hemlock, and and I just uh, I don't want to write it off. Um, let me see. What else do we have here? Do you think the HWA, oh, okay, given the HWA population seem to be becoming more cold tolerant, what do you think the prognosis is for northern New England? Uh, backtrack on that. I am. am hypothesizing that they could become more tol cold tolerant. Um, I don't really know that they have uh, and you know, it's going to take time and research to really see if that happens. My gut feeling is that it could. How long it'll take, I don't really know. Um, for northern New England, I don't know. 
uh, you know, it's like I'd just be wildly guessing to, to say anything that other than I don't know. Um, are there any maps or info on the years of HWA spread across New York State, uh, like the, when they arrived in the Catskills or the current front of the infestation? You know, I've been thinking about that, um, but um, you know, to be very honest, uh, 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 there's a lot of resources uh, that could produce such a map, but we're all working on Emerald Ash Borer right now. Um, I really want to uh, uh, work more on hemlock woolly adelgid. I think it's a really important time, um, and hopefully we'll we'll be able to get that uh, together. Um, it's interesting to watch the spread, um, and uh, you know it has been moving into the Catskills. I've watched it in the past ten years come up out of the Hudson River Valley and start to really get going in in some of the higher parts of the Catskills. Um, uh, it would be fun to to see such a progression, uh, and um, but the question is you know. How good is the data as well? And so, but good question. Thank you. Well, Mark, it looks like we've uh, covered all the questions. This was a once again a great presentation. I am always appreciative of speakers who are willing to give the same presentation twice in the same day. That's a can be a mentally taxing effort, particularly at the end of the day. But you, like always, you do a, a great job at the at the uh, first and the second go arounds. So I appreciate that. Um, well, I will call this webinar to a close. I'll thank all the participants, and again, thanks to Mark for a great and informative presentation. So everyone, enjoy your evening, and we'll see you next month and. I guess we're in June already, so that'll make it July when we talk about deer managing deer and their impacts on forests. So well, thank, thank you, you all. Pete. Have a good night. Good night, everybody.